Oh, well, hello there. My name is Max Feinstein, and while I am a human anesthesiology resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, I do sometimes wonder what would it be like to establish IV access on a dog or provide general anesthesia or even intubate an animal? In this video, I'm answering that question, but I can't do that here. So instead, I'm getting on an airplane and flying to sunny Southern California, where I'm meeting up with board certified veterinary anesthesiologist, Dr. Margaret Weipart at Surgipet Surgery and Anesthesia Center for Pets. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribe to the channel. The only question I have to figure out before I take off is whether this is more of a zebra scrub cap type of experience or a doggies and scrub type of experience. Let's find out. My name is Margaret Weipert and I'm an anesthesiologist, um, but anesthesiologist for animals as opposed to um, anesthesiologist here who's for humans. I was born, raised and educated in Poland and then uh, for my residency, which I did at UPenn, uh, I moved to the US to Philadelphia and uh, following residency I've been working in private practice as a veteran anesthesiologist. Can you talk through start to finish what an owner can expect when they bring their pet in for surgery just from the, the very beginning to the very end of that whole experience? It always starts the day before because we have to give instructions about fasting or medication, things like that. Um, then typically they bring the pet in the morning, we do a brief exam, make sure that nothing has changed since the last time we evaluated the patient. So we're just going to do a basic exam, checking his perfusion parameters, making sure, here you go, kind of just gently palpating along the airway, making sure we don't really anticipate any problems, we don't, checking lymph nodes. And then um, I'm gonna briefly just kind of look at his eyes, say that the pupils are symmetric, kind of good reflexes. So listening to the heart and lungs, the right side is okay. Going to the left, that's a nice strong heart. No murmurs, no arrhythmias, things look good. The lung sounds very quiet, which how it's supposed to be. We just gently palpate the belly. Um, I've been looking for, you know, large organs that are too large, making sure we don't really feel anything. And it's also a good way sometimes to find out if your patient is fasted, which he is. Checking pulses, making sure they're nice and symmetric. And there are some lymph nodes left here and that's about it. He doesn't seem lame, doesn't have any wounds. So he gets a tip of the nose to, to the tail exam and he seems to be in good health. So the next step would be to give him a little IM sedation so he gets even a little bit more quiet. And that sedation also will involve um, getting him some pain medication. And this is? Methadone. Methadone. So he gets methadone and dexmedetomidine. Okay. IM. The reason we administer dexmedetomidine is, uh, is, is A, it gives a good sedation, not only for now, but also when we recover the patient. Again, the more the younger, the more rambunctious they are before, the more we want to make sure they can smoothly recover. And it also has a little bit of an analgesic uh, effect in dogs. So it kind of adds to the whole multimodal analgesia, so pain management, making sure that they're not, they're very comfortable throughout and have no pain. He was very sedated until he was yeah. He was like, wait a minute, this is getting... <laughs> oh. So we're going to go ahead and we have already saline prepared, so we'll flush, just to flush drugs after administration. And then we're going to draw two um, induction agents, so something that we give to um, essentially make them completely asleep. One is the lidocaine, and the other one is the propofol. And so always label on a syringe, medication, double check that this is what you want. Each patient that comes here is different size. We can never truly, you know, give just a vial because it's never a, a same dose. And then for propofol, we're going to draw 15 cc's of that. So those are going to be our two induction drugs. 
And I noticed that there are no paralytics that you draw up for induction as no. well? No. So we very rarely paralyze them. And when we paralyze them, we don't paralyze them for induction um, because the airway situation is much easier than in people. So you don't really have to do that. Okay. One of the other differences that I noticed is that there are no opioids that you drew up for induction that mm -hmm. in humans we would ordinarily use to blunt um, a sympathetic response with, mm -hmm. with uh, yeah. intubation. So that's mostly because this dog got dexmedetomy in IM. So that's already blunts quite a lot of sympathetic. And he also got the methadone. Okay. So ordinarily for a dog like that, I wouldn't add opioid for the induction. Uh -huh. But yes, very commonly I use fentanyl along for induction, okay. especially if my sedation was not so strong. Okay. What's mm -hmm. your induction dose for um, propofol? It's for, for this guy, it's probably about two milligrams per kilogram because of the heavy sedation. Yeah. Normally it's about four to six. Wow. Yeah. All the doses we use, are way higher than most of the time in, in human medicine. Even in inhalant anesthetic, so your you know, gas anesthesia, the MAC is higher for pets than for humans. What's the purpose of the lidocaine that you have drawn up? So the lidocaine in terms of dexmedetomidine in, in dogs tends to prevent major bradycardia. So it tends to stabilize them a little bit with less blocks and less bradycardia. I haven't read a paper about that being an effect in people, but in dogs, we definitely see if you have really severe bradycardia secondary to dexmedetomidine, you can kind of give a little bit of a loading dose of lidocaine, continue this as an infusion, and it really stabilizes the heart rate as less of a bradycardia than with dexmedetomidine on board only. Okay. It does also has a theoretical effect of like preventing pain with propofol, which I think sometimes in pets is hard to evaluate. But I do believe that in human medicine, some patients prefer that. So what are your different access sites that you're able to use? So ordinarily, really, uh, we have two choices, which is one is on the front leg, which we call a cephalic vein. Um, and that's the main one that we use, obviously. And then there is a vein that is in the back leg that's called saphenous vein. Um, and ordinarily, those four veins are our main um, axis. You can um, occasionally place catheters, like in some breeds of dogs in the ear, not a great, you know, access, but in a, in a situations when you can't get it anywhere else, you can. And then obviously we have jugular catheter, which, in, which we can place as a central line, mm -hmm. but that's less uh, frequent, um, obviously, for like a standard case. And that's, generally speaking, you know, there's some tiny, depending on the, on the breed and on the patient, you can find some other extra vessels. But for the most part, those are our four main accesses. Do you ever use ultrasound for line placement? Not really. So in people, most of the limbs are flat at some point. So you can actually nicely put the ultrasound probe over. In dogs, you have to have a, um, there's almost always an angle. Um, and the other thing is that generally speaking, the vasculature in dogs um, is much smaller. So you, you will have to have, so yes, for the jugular catheters, we can use that um, to guide the placement, but we would not, uh, we would not do that for um, peripheral veins. And in this case, what Good. age IV are you using? 18. That was a beautiful IV placement. Thank you. Stefan has been doing this not only for a long time, she's been very good at this for a long time. <laughs> What's the smallest gauge catheter that you'll use for smaller dogs? 24 gauge, and we don't really <laughs> like them. They're very short. They the skin in dogs and cats is very thick, so you use a lot of um, catheter length just in, on like access to the actual vein. So then very little of it is inside of the vein and, and not only the gauge is super small, but also it's not a very reliable access. So we always try to get 22 at least. So what we're going to um, now administer it is an anti-emetic. It's called Serenia or Myropitent. It's a neurokinin antagonist. There is, I believe, a similar um, medication used in human medicine. A prepotent? Uh, yeah, maybe that. Um, so that's just kind of what we're going to do. Also, definitely, neither dogs or cats suffer from so much post-operative nausea and vomiting as people. Well, because dogs and cats can't talk, we just kind of try to make sure that even if this is this one-off case that will have nausea and vomiting, we covered our bases. 
typically run very little blood panel just prior to the um, anesthesia. I think this is how we kind of a little bit differ um, in a sense that again, I don't have this verbal communication. So there might be tiny symptoms that there's just no way to communicate other than verbally. So we tend to run more tests, I guess, in certain circumstances when you wouldn't do that in a human being. I can only assume that I'm not, nothing is wrong because I'm not seeing it but I have to have that internal information too. So we run, tend to run a little blood panel. What types of laboratories do you like to see for patients before you go in for routine surgery? Um, again, routine surgery, it's a CBC and like a baseline chemistry. Um, so we tend to do that all the time. You know, a lot of that, that comes back completely normal, but one in a hundred, you've got some results that you go like nobody would ever known just based on the clinical exam or how the pet is behaving probably have some symptoms, you know, that it's just not able to communicate with us. So probably every time it gets up, it flips a little off, but it's just not able to tell us. It's getting pretty sedate right now, which is nice. That's the, that's the purpose. We have him all set up for getting the, the induction going on. And what I'm going to do right now uh, is open, uh, we typically open three endotracheal tubes. The reason why is because every patient is a little different. And in terms of size for us, it's never a standard, you know, small range. Um, we um, can have the same dye a 1.5 kilogram dog and, you know, a 65 kilogram dog and anything in between. And even two dogs that weight the same amount, but they're two different breeds, will have a different size airway. So you never, like with time, you're pretty good at picking up which tube you want, like what size of endotracheal tubes you want to use, but you still want to have a choice just in case you miscalculate it. Uh, in your assessment. So obviously pretty standard thing. I'm just gonna check and make sure that the cuffs are good. Um, those are kind of a standard thing. I just want to make sure this is all holding. And so we're looking at an eight and a half internal diameter. Yes, that's an eight and a half. Um, and let me just deflate that all the way down. And then we're looking at the nine. I'm just gonna do, you know, the same step, make sure that the cuff is working. You never want to find out that it's not working after you intubate it, and that's good. So we're gonna deflate it now, so it's ready for us to go. And then the same with a 10 millimeter diameter. Did you prepare laryngoscope? Mm -hmm. And um, what size laryngoscope is that? This is Miller one. Because it's so easy to intubate dogs and cats, I don't, like, we don't really use, you know, oh, this patient will need this size and so on. Um, we essentially just use whatever we have in our hand. Is this, this something... the same Miller one that's used to intubate human children? Yeah, I'm sure. Amazing. Yeah. And then I have a little gauze because we'll have to, um, I like to grab their tongue. The tongue compared to people is really long, so I have to get it out of the way all together, all out. And so I use a little gauze to help me with that. And this is a, um, a e tube tie that I'm going to use to secure the um, endotracheal tube. Mm -hmm. It has this nice color so you don't miss it. Um, and then we prepared a little eye loop, obviously. And then um, you can always lubricate a little bit uh, the end of the endotracheal tube. So you can all open the eye. Um, and I guess then we should be pretty good for induction yep. in the OR. We, um, we shave pretty well, um, so we don't have to uh, shave in the OR, which would be a big no, absolutely not because of that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to move all of that, our setup there to the, uh, to the OR. The monitor is the same, human anesthesia company, uh, mind ray, the anesthesia machine the same. Um, the cuffs, we can use the actual like human ones, you know, they tend to be a little too short for, because this is like a classic neonatal. Um, but we actually prefer the ones that are, as you can see, a little longer, just because of the anatomy, the leg is uh, comparably just a little bit thicker. Mm -hmm. So like they have to be like a, a little funny um, pictures. The rest is, is essentially, I guess the same. Uh, the endotracheal is the same, syringe is the same. Uh, the way we tie it will be a little different. And then obviously the mask is different. There's no way to really get a really tight, uh, you know, fit on the mask. So like mask ventilation, that's not really, I mean, 
if you have to, you should definitely try, but that's not really happening. Mm -hmm. And is this the mask that you would Sorry. use if you were to attempt mask ventilation? Uh, I would definitely try to get an airway. So like this is where you really don't have anything else. Yeah. So I would, I would say mask ventilation doesn't exist unless it's your last resort, you know. Uh, you're on a, I don't know, lone island. This is all you have. <laughs> so yes, definitely, but that's not, you should always attempt to get an airway just because in animals it's so much easier. All right, so time for um, induction. So this is when we're gonna really make him sleepy, go to the, you know, plane of anesthesia. Um, again, we talked about it, I'll start with lidocaine and then I'll give the propofol to effect. So until I think that I can intubate him, which won't take much, he's already pretty, pretty satiated. All right, so that's our lidocaine going in. And done. Yes. And surely there is recording this. Super helpful always. And then we're just gonna real slow, kind of going with, you know, about real slow. Not much. And see if we can get him going. Right. Pressure is 127 over 73 with a Okay, thank you. So, as I say, we have to pull the tongue all the way out. This is our glottis, right? And then here's the airway. Beautiful cords. Right. <laughs> a 180 so very, degree view from what I'm used to. Yeah, <laughs> 100%. So, as I say, this is typically when I would say that I don't really need a laryngoscope. You have someone holding and you can, you know, easily slide the tube right in. And 10 was exactly what we anticipate that we're gonna need. We're gonna now tie the tube so it's secure. And then I'm gonna inflate the cuff. I'm just gonna put him at about one and a half. He's pretty deep, and we'll let him, let him chill on that. And just to make sure I didn't miss it, what uh -huh. is your maintenance agent that you're using? Um, Sevoflurane. Now we are, we are pretty happy about everything. We can go ahead and position him um, for the actual surgery. Which ventilator mode are you on right now? Uh, volume control. Um, so setting up the volume as a primary parameter. What type of uh, tidal volumes do you typically use? Um, so what I find out is that, you know, trying to set up with about seven, eight mLs per kilogram, um, since it's a short brief ventilation, you know, trying to be using the uh, lung protective strategy is not so important. And they tend to have too low of a vent volume if you use less. So that's kind of the typical thing we do. If I were just looking at this ventilator, I would have a very difficult time telling the difference between a yeah, it's small uh, human and a dog. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing would be like, oh, this is a super tiny volume. What are you doing? But other than that, yes. So I just placed the temperature probe. We put out a little bit just in the nose. The surface temperature uh, measurement doesn't work well in animals, so we tend to you know, try to get more of a core temperature, if you will, but if I put it in the esophagus, they tend to have a higher incident of reflex and inflammation of the esophagus, and that is just not something that I accept. And is this the pulse oximeter that's on yes. his tongue? Yes. Probably a little difficult to put a pulse oximeter on an extremity. Yes, absolutely. I put a portable pulse ox on my Toy Poodle once who has a white coat uh -huh. and it did read 98.99. I wasn't okay. sure if it was real. It could be. <laughs> I know. 
Um, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Who's the star? <laughs> the typical thing, right? Surgery starts and anesthesiologist is like, eh, uh, uh. I just wanted to make sure our surgeon got sufficient attention so that we can, we can spend the rest of the time talking about anesthesia. I know. No, getting. thank you for maintaining my marriage. You know, this is very important. Is it common for veterinary surgeons to um, be concerned about the patient moving? Do, yes. you, do you get a lot of feedback about that? Oh, they always. Uh, and I say that the only surgeons that have full right to be concerned about that are large animal surgeons. So movement for a horse, a giraffe, a cow, a elephant, a tiger, a lion, that is a concern. Uh, what I do if the lion moves, I just run away. <laughs> I go like, good luck. Obviously, I'm joking, but yes, there are species of uh, animals that you definitely do not want them to move. Then, obviously, certain types of procedures, you know, um, eye procedures. Um, definitely, you have to be um, on the watch for that. You don't want that. It means you're if you're with that surgery. But the majority of the time for our patients, you know, we, we definitely don't want them to move. But if it happens, it's not a big deal. Let's put it this way. Judging by your question, it's something that you guys get a lot talked about. Um, I, no comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's just say there are, are uh, colleagues of mine who watch these videos that I make, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you ever listen to music in the operating room? I don't like it, and luckily a lot of surgeons that I work with do not either. Um, I, I guess I don't mind it if it's a slower, quiet music, a super happy, loud music. Um, it's definitely something that it interferes with my um, mind turning. So we typically try to have a, you know, settle at some level that's acceptable to everyone. So now obviously just a, uh, Routine, monitoring, nothing's happening, the boring nothing which we love. While we're doing all the things still and you know, watch all the monitors, making sure things are okay. But that's how we like it. What's the purpose of the Doppler that you have? In here? So we can use that to um, measure blood pressure as well. Um, it is in, I routinely prefer that way to measure blood pressure in all patients that are less than 10 kilograms. So like dachshunds are the best example, like you have this really thick base of the leg, it's very short, and then it thins out really quickly. Mm. So the blood pressure cuffs don't work that well, and so then the Doppler metal is better. Done? Did you uh, infiltrate? Well, yes, I did. Okay. All right, I'm going to turn that off. I did, about five minutes ago, switch him to the pressure support so that he can just get support while he's, um, you know, getting some spontaneous breaths. Um, so he's breathing on his own uh, in preparation for, like, them finishing up the surgery. Is there an entitled amount of inhaled anesthetic that you wait for until you extubate? Well, yes and no. So I, I do like it uh, to go, you know, around 0.4 or less before I extubate. But most of the time, at that point, they give you a good indication they are ready to be extubated. And again, with this guy, any, any, um, you know, young dogs that are typically really pretty anxious, um, I tend to slow down the recovery process, make sure the emergence is smooth. I rather wait a little bit longer than anything else. So he's getting like, we, you can, we can tell that he's getting a little bit of a Joe tone. Let's see, like he's just resisting me a little bit. So I think we are getting ready to extubate him. Um, and sometimes what we can also do, come on. Hi, Bobby. Hi, oh, Bobby. We can sit him up and see what he does. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. Like a sack of potatoes. How do you feel about this? Hi, Bobby. Just kidding? Just kidding. 
You like to sleep in? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's like, yeah. <laughs> At this point, he's been breathing spontaneously for yes. a while now. For a while, yeah, absolutely. Do you ever do deep extubation? You know, mostly wild cats and things like that, um, or non-domestic cats. Like those are the ones that we excavate fairly deeply, and we move them to a safe enclosure. Um, you know, while they still pretty deep in their plane, and then we reverse them, and you know, we try to be on the other side of the <laughs> enclosure when it happens. I think that's a shared experience as well. There are some patients, particularly young, ah, yeah. young men, as I'm sure you've seen when they wake yes. up from anesthesia. <laughs> Can we get a couple more nurses, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was actually interesting to me to see that. Yeah, they, they um, but I think for a different reason. I think they're not quite knowing. Well, the patients I'm talking about, the moment they realize what's happening, they're really after you. <laughs> Hi, Bobby. Hi. We need more. Nope. Okay, Bobby. Ready? Mm -hmm. Good job, Here we Bob. go, Bobby. That's yours. That's yours. Don't be worried about that. It's okay. Hi. Oh boy. All right, let's disconnect him and I think we can move him out. I have to say, very amazing to watch from start to finish. It's so similar. <laughs> but you, I mean, you knew that. I told you. Yeah. <laughs> doggy pack you right here that I'm looking at? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we don't really uh, design parts as a pack you, but yes. When we finish and they are recovered or in, in our pack you, so recovery unit, uh, we either text or call the owner going, hey, we are in recovery, do things doing okay. Um, and then um, most of the time after a couple hours, depending obviously on the, on the situation, uh, we call them to say, hey, you can come and pick up. Um, and then we have a whole conversation about like, what are the, the goal, like what are the steps now? Um, if the pet needs to be, you know, stay hospitalized and obviously stays hospitalized and we just communicate as we go. If somebody is interested in coming here, either they're already in Southern California or they would like to travel to Southern California mm -hmm. to have their, their pet evaluated for surgery here, how do they find you? Um, so the easiest way is always, you know, internet. So they can go to the website, um, it's surgipet.com. Um, there's an information there. You can fill in the uh, contact form. You can email us. You can call our um, care co There's a patient care coordinator that can take care of that. And from there, you know, we can guide um, someone through the whole process because obviously this is a sort of a referred case. So we would like still to talk to the primary doctor, find out medical records, you know, what's the reason for the surgery, make sure that we are able to provide that care and we are able to, most importantly, that we also able to provide the post-operative care. Um, and, you know, we, we can definitely arrange that, um, but that's the easiest way. What species do you care for here? Uh, dogs and cats. Thank you so much for your Most time. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come into your practice <laughs> and see how you do veterinary anesthesia. This has been so fascinating. All right, not a problem. Hey, if you ever can arrange me to come and, and, and you know, shadow you, I'll be more than happy. To. That'd be amazing. And I'll have you, you know, I, I can have you shadow like an actual board certified. You know, real I don't, I don't wait, I don't wait, fine. You know, I, I'm sure they're teaching you, right? That's, that's the idea. <laughs> yeah, that's the then, idea. you know, I can just listen to the same thing. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, this, this has been so fascinating. Thank you. Okay. I'll break you all this stuff down. Right. I see the stuff is coming. Okay, excellent. All right. If you found this video as fascinating as Kobe or I did, stay tuned for a sit-down interview that I did with Dr. Y Part, which I'll be posting soon to my channel. And once it's up, I'll put a link right here. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.